Today we're going to have another look at the key quotes for Inspector Calls. Remember, you can get a character question or you will get a theme question and that will be ultimately what you choose depending on which choice you make in the exam. So the first thing that we need to look at um, and that you should have already looked at is Eva Smith. So if you haven't watched that video, go back and have a look at the video that I have done previously. We're going to look at Sybil Burling today. So we're going to move on to her. Now, when it comes to Sybil Burling, we need to have a look at everything that she does that creates an issue for other people in the play. And that's what we'll start out with right now. So although a seemingly harmless character at the start, we do see Sybil create a lot of issues for people in the play through the way she speaks. At the start, she just seems to be a very put together and closed off woman of the upper class. However, as the play goes on, a lot of her words and her language reveal her to be quite a problematic person. So you'll notice on this slide that some of the quotations come from Sybil, but others are about her. And that's really important because obviously you create a character and Priestley creates the character by mixing a ton of different opinions and ideas from not just that character but other characters and their perceptions of Sybil so what they think about her what their opinions are but we'll look at the way that Sybil speaks first so we'll look at Mrs Burling's actual quotations first so the first one that I want to look at is as if a girl of that sort would ever refuse money just in that bottom corner now the reason I want to look at this one and I want to analyze this one is because I think that you can zoom in on it very very well and pick up those assessment objective two marks where it is about zooming in on the language so firstly I want to zoom in on the word girl so the noun girl means child a female child or an adolescent a very young woman and actually the reason that she's using that is because she's trying to belittle Eva and that noun really symbolizes the lack of respect that Mrs Burling has for these lower class women she infantilizes them to infantilize a person is to treat them as a child or to treat them in a way that doesn't acknowledge the fact that they have experiences and they are you know adults in some way so I think we can kind of unpack this quotation a lot and we can look at that noun girl in a lot of detail as well we've also got the word sort that sort and that's really interesting because she's categorizing her she's putting her in a group so when she says sort she means the working class and putting her in that category means that she's lumping them all together and she's making a sweeping judgment about them when they are lumped together which is prejudice so this is a quotation that does show that prejudice it's also interesting that she seems to think that because eva smith is a working class young woman that she has no moral scruples and by the word scruples, I mean when you actually kind of feel like something is wrong and you hesitate to do it and you think I don't really want to do it because it doesn't feel right. So by saying that she would never refuse money, whether it was stolen or not, because obviously we know that Eva Smith knows that Eric is stealing the money. It shows that Mrs. Burling sees the lower classes as immoral people as people who will not do the right thing so basically accusing them of being sort of dishonest and almost criminal which becomes ironic later on because it turns out to be her son who was the thief and it turns out that Eva Smith did have those scruples and actually it's really good because in this one quotation 
and the irony of it coming up later that it was her son, it really just absolutely shatters Mrs. Burling's view of the working class. And it's a way for Priestley to highlight that actually the working classes were heavily judged and it was the upper classes that perhaps needed to reflect on themselves and their own moral scruples. The next one that I want to look at is you're not the type you don't get drunk. Now, the reason I find this one very interesting, and this is on my list of top quotations for Sybil Burling, is that this comes up when she's talking to Eric later in the play. But she's already been told by Sheila and Gerald before that Eric drinks too much. So what you have here is ignorance. She has chosen to be ignorant she has chosen to ignore the problems that her son is showing and I think it's quite interesting when she says you're not the type you don't get drunk she says type so once again Priestley is using and choosing Mrs. Burling's language very carefully to show that she makes these judgments about people. She puts them in types. She puts them in categories. So actually saying you're not the type, you don't get drunk. It suggests that Mrs. Burling believes that her family are above others. And perhaps that's because of their class, because she thinks they're a respectable upper class family. So it's really interesting here where she's ignoring the problems of her family because she just thinks that they must be fine because they're of the right class. And again, shows her prejudice really well as a quotation. The next one I would like to look at is when she is talking about the inspector and the rude way he spoke to Mr. Burling at me and me. It was quite extraordinary. The reason I find that one interesting was because, again, she was expecting that she would be respected no matter what. And again, that's because of her class. So she calls the inspector rude. I find it quite interesting that she uses that adjective for the inspector when she was the one who immediately came into the inspector and starts trying to intimidate him. So if you look back in your inspector calls plays, you will see that when Mrs. Berlin comes in to talk to the inspector, one of the first things that she mentions is that Mr. Berlin plays golf with basically the inspector's sort of bosses, the people who are higher up on the police force. And I find that really interesting. So she calls him rude. But she was the one who immediately came in to intimidate him. And we could say that that is quite rude behavior. So there's more irony when it comes to her character there. Also, she says it's quite extraordinary. So again, we've got another very over the top adjective here from her when she says extraordinary, because she thinks it is absolutely ridiculous that someone of a lower class would step out of that class for a second to speak to her that way or to speak down to her in any way at all. So we can see again, she's upholding all those class values here. She's really sort of very set in her ways, very set in the rigid class system. By rigid, I mean very, very strict, very stuck together. So there's a rigidity in that class system and she's stuck on that as well. Then I have put these two quotations here because I think they're quite similar, but they both show the same thing. Now, this is really kind of repetition reiteration with Priestley sort of choosing to highlight a few times that Mrs. Burling doesn't take blame. And again, if we see Mrs. Burling as someone who represents all of the upper class women at the time and definitely the upper class in 1912 we can see that actually what she's saying here is that she is refusing to accept blame but that symbolizes that the upper classes did not want to accept blame even though we can see clearly that she did things that she should be blamed for and that brings me back to my favourite quotation, which is a chain of events. Now, I have explained this before, but I'll explain it again. A chain is only as strong as its weakest link. So, if any person in the Burling family 
chose to show Eva some kindness, they would have broken the chain of her misery and suffering and therefore she wouldn't or probably wouldn't have committed suicide. And that really shows that she has missed the point of what the inspector was trying to show. And that's that every one of your actions has a consequence. And you may not be directly to blame for something, but actually you can add to something that goes on in someone else's life. So you can sort of add to that chain and you can add to their suffering. And eventually a person can't stand the suffering that you've been adding to. So it may not be directly Mrs. Burling's fault necessarily because other people were to blame too, but she still shares her part of the blame. And that's what the chain of events is. So again, it's interesting here that she says, I accept no blame, but actually she is to blame. And that is made clear within the play. But then we will see that actually she blames her son and she says, I'm ashamed of you. Now, I kind of like to link that one to this one up here because I find them both very interesting when you put them together. And I think you could put these together in a paragraph as well, or at least have a paragraph that links on from um, the last one. So when she says, Eric, I'm absolutely ashamed of you, I find that quite interesting because she's ashamed of her son but she has ignored his problems up until now so I think it calls into question I think Priestley wanted to call into question her as a mother and actually how well she raised her children and to what extent their actions were her fault because you can see how Sheila makes judgments about people just like her mother her mother ignores Eric's problems so Eric's problems never get better they just get worse so I think it's interesting that we call her into a question as a mother here and she seems to be ashamed of Eric but she's not ashamed of herself at all and then obviously we link that to those two quotations over here I also find it interesting as well that she says I was the only one of you who didn't give in to him and again, that's Mrs. Burling trying to portray herself as a lot stronger and perhaps more determined than her family. So when she says I didn't give in to him, she sort of is calling out her family as weak. And she is pointing out that she sees them as weak and she sees their behavior around the inspector as weak. And what's interesting there is that she is said to be, that is terrible highlighting, she is said to be her husband's social superior. So that means that she grew up in a very wealthy family, more wealthy than Mr. Burling. And it's interesting that she is basically seeing herself as above her family again. So Mrs. Burling is very very proud she's a very proud person she refuses to change and I think that's interesting because she really does represent um the upper classes in that sense through all of these quotations from her so the quotations that we now need to look at are the quote the quotations from other people that are the perceptions of her and this adds to our understanding of her the first one I want to look at is Inspector Gaul, who said you refused her even the pitiable little bit of organised charity you had in your power to grant her. Now, pitiable is an adjective meaning very, very small. So he basically says here twice, uses uh, very similar adjectives, pitiable little. And I find that interesting because he is trying to emphasize how Mrs. Burling would not have given anything up to help this person. Mrs. Burling's life would have go, gone on completely unchanged if she had helped Eva, but she still chose not to. That little thing from Mrs. Burling would have made a huge difference in Eva's life. And it really does show the impact that the upper classes had on the lower classes. And I think that that is what Priestley was doing here with his language choice of the two adjectives side by side and how he was trying to symbolize how the upper classes had such great influence over the lower classes. 
And that really links well to Sheila's two quotations for her mother. We really must stop with these silly pretenses. Her mother is an, a symbol of the upper class and at the time. The upper classes were overly concerned with reputation and overly concerned with how they were seen. Now, it could be said, and you could definitely argue this in an essay, that Mrs. Burling is the head of a charity purely for reputation. She is not the head of a charity because she enjoys charity work. And we can see that with the way that she treats Eva. Now, it's interesting that Sheila says we need to drop the pretenses and she calls them silly as well. So we've got another adjective here. And I do think zooming in on adjectives is absolutely worth it. But when she says silly, it really shows how her mother's views of the world are quite childish, actually. And that's, again, quite ironic, considering she's been treating Sheila as a child this entire time. But to say silly pretenses, Sheila's really showing that actually, mother, you are playing. You are, everything you're doing is silly, is ridiculous, because you are basically saying that you are better than everyone else, that you don't know anything, that you're not aware of ev what any of us have done. And it's all a bit ridiculous because, again, as the audience, we can see that, you know, she is really sort of play acting here. She's not an honest person. And Sheila really points that out. I also think it links quite nicely to you began to learn something and now you've stopped. Um, you're ready to go on in the same old way. Again, terrible highlighting on my behalf. So it's interesting because Sheila does learn and she does change. But again, we have that symbol of Mrs. Burling and she symbolizes all of those upper class people who refuse to change, who refuse to do anything differently. And it's interesting that once again, you begin to learn something. Now you've stopped, you're ready to go on in the same old way. It shows how the older generation are more into that rigid class system. And the younger generation are more able to change. So that's Mrs. Burling. That's every quotation that I think you would need. Obviously, you won't need to need all of these. You won't need to use all of these in your exam. However, these are all of the quotations that I can think of that would build an amazing essay around Sybil, around Mrs. Burling and the way she's presented in the play. Don't forget like and subscribe if you like this video and I will be doing more on the characters.